another presentation or uh, another paper that you had at Uber, it was probably both, um, that we thought was particularly interesting and wanted to highlight here was you talked about the learning process in neural networks. So you talked you talked about top down versus bottom up or even synchronized. And so that isn't something that I've thought about before. So when I think about training a neural network, I think about having what's called the forward pass where you go from some input to some output. So for example, if it's a machine vision algorithm, the input could be the pixels of an image. And then the outcome is the prediction of the class of that image. It says, hey, this is a cat or this is a truck or this is Jason Yasinski or whatever. Mm, yep. um, so you have this forward pass from the input to the output. And then the, the gradient descent that allows us to update all of the parameters throughout all the layers of the neural network, that goes backwards, we call it back propagation from the output layer back towards the input layer. Yeah, so Jason, fill us in and let me know if my kind of high level summary or any of my ideas there made any sense related to your paper from 2019, which was in the most prestigious uh, AI conference called NeurIPS. And the paper was called LCA loss change allocation for neural network training. Mm, yeah. Uh, prestigious conference, also basically the last conference for a couple of years. The last conference we all met in person in uh, Vancouver before COVID killed like in person conferences for a couple of years. Uh, yeah. So loss change allocation um, was a paper. The first author is Janice Lan, um, who, who was at Uber at the time. Our goal here was to really start to build something like that, a oscilloscope or maybe a microscope that helps us examine training. So let's imagine you have a network and it has 10 layers and you start training that network and you watch your loss, to, loss go down. Now let's imagine as you're watching that loss go down, I'm sneaky and I grab one of the layers and I just freeze it. And the rest of the nine layers keep training, but layer you know four in the middle or something is frozen and stops, stops learning. Do you think you would notice that in the actual loss signal? I guess if you had two runs and they were identical in every way except for that, you might notice a little like deviation. Maybe the learning slows down a little bit. But more or less, the fact that I just grabbed, you know, 10 million out of your 100 million or something parameters and completely froze them is mostly not visible to you, which we thought was just silly. And so we tried to build a method that would let you see learning, but on an individual neuron level. This is really tricky to do because in some sense, if you define learning as just the function represented by the network changing over time to better fit the data set, then learning is really a prop property of the entire network. But we came up with a way of breaking down the change in loss, allocating it to individual neurons in such a way that the little score of all the neurons, if you add them all up, you get a score for the entire network, which exactly matches the change of the loss. Okay, so cool idea. So we took this and we and implementing it efficiently is a little tricky, but we found some approach that worked well enough. We took this around and started training networks. And as they're training, we watch every single neuron and we kind of see, is it learning? Is it going the right way? Or is it uh, kind of anti-learning, so going the wrong way? Um, we can assess that by looking at the training loss. Is the training loss going down for that neuron or up for that neuron? Separately, we can look, is the validation loss going down or up for that neuron or that parameter? Thanks to my earlier discussion. John and I's earlier discussion about parameters versus neurons. You could do this on a neuron level or a parameter level. Um, so you can watch validation versus train and figure out if a neuron or a parameter is individually fitting, as in fitting both train and val, or overfitting, as in fitting train but not val. So we did all this. We ran the method. We generated lots of plots. Um, a method like this generates a ton of data. You basically have one number per parameter per time step of the training, which is a huge volume of numbers. It's like you have to snapshot the network every single step. And what we found was more or less a huge mess. So we found a lot, a lot of data, a lot of neurons doing a lot of things. And it was really hard to sift through this data and make sense, make sense of it all in a way that led to a clear story. So I would say that was one of our, one of our first conclusions from this paper. We did find a few things. So if you just look at all the parameters together, it turns out that throughout most of training, most parameters are swinging kind of back and forth. And if you think of it as like being in a, in a little valley, in a little U, they're more or less going up and down the, um, the walls of this valley. So about half the time they're going the right way to the bottom of the valley, decreasing loss. The other half of the time they're just going up, up the valley, increasing the loss. So I think our number from one of the networks was 50 
50.3% of the time parameters were going in the right direction and 49.7% of the time they were literally going the wrong direction. But because there's so many parameters and so many time steps, on average, the network is actually learning and the loss actually does go down. We also found some fun things. For example, some layers for the entire course of training, if you add up all the progress they made, literally take the network backwards. So they literally hurt the network. We found this, I think, in many cases uh, for the last layer of networks. And so our hypothesis was, well, if you just freeze the last layer and don't let it learn anything, you might literally help the network. And so we did that, and it did help the network. It worked. Why does this happen? Interesting question. Could be a follow-up paper. I can go into that, maybe. But just the fact that it was happening and that we were able to measure it and that maybe people should consider measuring these sorts of things, I think, was a partial fulfillment of our, of our goal. There's a lot of other plots in the paper, a lot of other work, um, and honestly, a lot of other data that's like hard to analyze because there's so much happening in a high-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. Is that is kind of the intuition there behind because the final layer is closest to the cost function that you're optimizing, that it can be easiest in a way to figure out with gradient descent that that is what we should be changing. So I think you were talking about just there freezing the final layer does. And so maybe freezing that final layer has the positive impact because by freezing that final layer, you're allowing the penultimate layer and the third last layer mm. to be able to do more learning than they otherwise could. All right, so you wanna you wanna dive <laughs> into this? Okay, let's do it. Um, okay, first let's assume the network is configured in a way that's like relatively sane. In other words, no net, no layers are configured super horribly. Let's imagine we're in a case of classification. Let's imagine, for the sake of example, it's something like ImageNet. So there's a thousand classes on the output layer. So there's a thousand neurons in that output layer. Let's say we initialize the network randomly, so the loss is really high. And then we run a bunch of separate experiments. Let's say we froze, froze all the layers and then just thawed one, and we just trained that one layer at a time. No matter what layer we choose, do you think it would work? Do you think it would learn, learn something? I think so. I can't immediately think of a reason why not. Yeah, so pretty much, as long as you didn't the initialization in some pretty catastrophic way, any individual layer will indeed learn. It will move the network in the right direction, and it'll push that loss down. Of course, in practice, we don't train one layer at a time, even though we could, because it's, it's much slower. You do all this forward and backward computation, you may as well use all those gradients that you just spent forever getting and train all the parameters instead. Okay, so why, how did we find that this last layer doesn't learn net? We found this kind of complicated, kind of beautiful story where um, the layers are individually learning, swinging back and forth, and there's this sort of... Uh, periodic motion, if that periodic motion is synchronized between all the layers, they're all kind of learning together. In some cases, if networks, if the layer gets too far behind, then it's kind of like doing the right periods, but it's always like so far behind the other layers' representations that it's like learning based on the old representations. And on average, it's more wrong than right. And this basic fact is why freezing the last layer helped. So if you just say, stop, stop trying, you're always too slow. You're always learning too far behind everyone else. That actually improved the situation. It's a completely different way of seeing why this might be a reasonable idea. And I can give you that explanation as well. So let's say we have a classification network. It's got a thousand classes, like we said. One of them is dog, one of them is cat, one of them is lion. What is dog? Okay, we have to decide as a human engineer, we have to decide a dog in this network is going to be represented by a one hot vector. One zero 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 zero. What is cat? Zero one zero zero. We chose that arbitrary vector, starting with one, one in the second spot, one in the third spot, to represent the concept of dog. But why did we choose that? Well, we wanted to spread out the ones, I guess. We wanted to have them all be unique, I guess. Okay, but let's imagine another representation. Let's take those vectors and sort of back project them through the last layer. So let's say that very last layer had a thousand neurons, the one before it had, let's say 4,000. So back project those one hotback vectors through that 4,000 by 1,000 matrix, and you'll get uh, a thousand vectors of length 4,000. And now they're not one hot, they're just a random vector in that 4,000 dimensional space. Happens to be almost guaranteed mostly orthogonal, just from the way random vectors work. So if we freeze that last layer, all we're doing is we're saying to a slightly shorter network, 
please learn to represent dog. And instead of this one hot thing we chose, we're choosing a random vector in this 4,000 dimensional space. Does that work better or worse? I don't know. Turns out it works better, like a, a, as measured. Really? Not every time, but actually quite a lot. And there's, there's a paper, and I, I can't remember the, the author off the top, top of my head. There's a paper that showed this worked in a number of cases. And mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if they recommended you just do this all the time because it's, it's just a good idea. Right. And so to kind of recap that idea back to you, it's instead of having an arbitrary one, one hot hot vector, you take your randomly initialized initialization <laughs> where there are random vectors in the penultimate layer, but those map to our one hot and it gives a much more nuanced dense kind of much more dense much more dense right yeah much more dense representation to be mapping into yeah that's cool i had never thought of that it yeah how did you think to do oh i guess it, that came out from freezing different layers and seeing what happens yeah exactly exactly um uh-huh. just came out came out of the measurement um now there there is still a nice a nice feature of going through that last layer and finishing in the network it's that you get to use actual cross entropy loss and have an actual probabilistic interpretation. Like you don't want to just randomly initialize vectors and then use a mean squared loss because that's that's a different loss. So probably you should still be using cross entropy unless you have a really specific reason not to. Um, but yeah, cool. cho- choosing that random representation um, seems like a fine idea though. Wow, very cool. Um, I learned something that sounds like very fundamental understanding of neural networks today. So that is cool. That doesn't always happen on the show.